Hi and welcome to Cyber Reason's Malicious Life. I'm Ren Levy. Panel, if you'll, uh, gentlemen, would come forward. We're joined today by the seven members of the Loft uh, Hacker Think Tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On May 19, 1998, a group of young guys who called themselves the Loft walked into a chamber on Capitol Hill to testify before the United States Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs. They were all dressed for the occasion, suits, ties, and all the rest. But right away, it was pretty obvious that these weren't the type of guys you'd usually find in such a room before such a committee. Uh, due to the sensitivity of the work done at the loft, they'll be using their hacker names of Mudge, Weld, Brian Oblivion, Kingpin, Space Rogue, Tan, and Stefan. Everybody in the room seems to be on the same page. Whatever is going on here, it's a little funny. <laughs> I, uh, I hope my grandkids don't ask me who my witnesses were today and <laughs> say Space Rogue. The kids who called themselves Space Rogue and Kingpin were not fooling around, however. I'm informed that you uh, think that it, within 30 minutes the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. Actually, one of us with just a few packets. Since 1998, the story of how a ragtag bunch of hackers made it into the Senate and said in front of cameras that they could take down the entire United States in the time it takes to listen to a malicious life podcast has become rather famous. It's been told in numerous magazine articles and television interviews, and it's actually quite funny like in how the Loft guys drove to D.C. with a van full of electronic surveillance equipment, took the wrong turn, and drove straight into the NSA headquarters. If you're not familiar with that story, don't worry. Our upcoming B-side episode will be an interview I did with Chris Weisopel, a.k.a. Weldpond, about his days in Loft and that specific incident. But what's not as well known as the story of the Senate hearing is how they got there, who these guys were, what they were up to, and what they'd been doing that might have earned them such an invitation. The behind-the-scenes story of Loft isn't often told, so we wanted to tell it on this podcast. But then our senior producer, Nate Nelson, had a better idea. Maybe they can tell it better than we could. For my part, I'll pop up here and there during the interview to give you some essential context. Enjoy. My name's John Lester, hacker handle uh, count zero. Uh, I currently live in Montreal, Canada. I was one of the co-founders of the original loft when it spun up in the south end of Boston, and I am a longtime member of the Cult of the Dead Cow. That's it. Uh, how about Space Rogue? You want to go? Introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Space Rogue. Okay. <laughs> a I man of run, few words. Uh, I was a member of Loft Heavy Industries. I used to run Hacker News Network, Black Mac Archives. I've since done Cyber Squirrel 1. Currently work at IBM and live in the Philadelphia area. How about Chris? You want to go next? Introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Chris Weisopel. Um, I uh, my hacker name is Weld Pond. Um, I joined the loft back when we were at the Waltham Street uh, location in Boston, and um, I guess I was part of the software the software vulnerability research group of of the loft as we got to later and loft crack was one of the projects i worked on uh joe all right hi um my name is joe grand also known as kingpin uh i joined the loft in 92 when i was 16 um so all through my formative years um in both the old 
space and the new, so kind of two separate lives there. Um, and uh, I live out in Portland, formerly the anarchist jurisdiction of Portland. And uh, I teach hardware hacking and electronics and pretty much do everything I was doing at the loft, but somehow made it into a living. All right, Christian. Hi, my name is Christian Ryu, uh, also known as Dill Dog. Um, longtime member of uh, the Cult of the Dead Cow as well. And uh, the first paid employee of the loft, uh, I was doing advisories uh, in uh, hacking Windows and Internet Explorer when the loft uh, folks and I managed to meet up at a 2600 meeting. They dragged me in and uh, got me a desk so I could uh, hack on loft crack and back Orpus 2000 and a bunch of other stuff. So. Today I'm living uh, outside of Washington, D.C. and doing security for a large uh, fruit company. Sometimes nostalgia can obscure reality. We remember the good old days more fondly than we actually should. The hacker scene of the 90s was not a case of misplaced nostalgia. It really was as great as it's remembered. Long before cyber criminals and nation states took over, hacking was when weirdo nerds got their hands on cool gadgets and wrote code that did new kinds of things. It was epitomized by online forums and publications like 2600, the Hacker Quarterly, where hackers wrote about the internet, telephone systems, whatever seemed hackable. It was also epitomized by groups like Loft in Massachusetts and Cult of the Dead Cow in Texas, which also counted Loft members Dildog, Count Zero, and Mudge among its ranks. Also, Charlie Chaplin's grandnephew and former presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke. Loft were always the good guys, always law-abiding, always hacking to help, not harm. Cult of the Dead Cow was the bigger, naughtier cousin, organizing crusades against Chinese internet censorship and Scientology, and literally inventing the term hacktivism along the way. Sometimes they went a little further, though, like that time they claimed to have personally given Ronald Reagan Alzheimer's using a blowgun. Uh, so my first question may be for John or any of you who were around at that time. I just want to know, how did Loft get started and, and why? Place to store all of our stuff. That's what happened. Um, the virtual background for me is actually my desk at the original Loft um, photo of that. We, we used to make a lot of whipped cream products here. You can see the... <laughs> it's, yeah, it was... Um, it was basically me and Brian Oblivion were living in the South End in the same brownstone you know, on different floors. And um, we were, it was two things. One, it was, we were collecting a lot of hardware from the MIT flea market. And we're like, wow, our respective significant others are complaining about all this stuff that's sitting in the house. And also, um, our significant others were looking to start up a business making, um, hats it was it's a long story but anyway they were like we, we need a big work area and so basically oblivion and i were, were like maybe there's some kind of a loft space we can rent around here because the south end at the time was um it was not gentrified as it is now it was mostly artists and there were a lot of um industrial areas that were just sort of you know big open spaces you know wood floors open beam ceilings and all that stuff and um so we were looking around and we found a place like right around the corner in the South end from where we lived. And we're like, man, we can just get this space here. And at the time we were also interested in the hacker community in, in Boston and, 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 and beyond. And we had, um, you know, made friends with people in other countries, remember in the Netherlands, the hack tick people who were like, you know, creating these sort of things they were calling them like hacker spaces. And it's like, ah, it's kind of a cool idea, a space where we could just kind of have people hang out. And I had started working with uh, Emmanuel Goldstein at 2600 Magazine to spin up uh, 2600 meetings in the Boston area because he was, I had t- was talking to him one day and he's like, yeah, there's nothing going on in Boston. Why don't you just start something? I'm like, okay. And that dovetailed eventually with Jason Scott doing stuff for the works as well, which is awesome. 
And so then it just kind of all came together and we ended up having, it's like, oh, this is rent this space. Ta-da. First thing we did, we filled it with stuff like this. And then at some point, I can't remember what happened, but at some point there was somebody in the, I think it was Mass Eye in the Air. They were decommissioning or somewhere else. They were decommissioning like an old Vax. It's like, yeah, we could put a Vax, compu- you know, mainframe computer in here too. Why not? This is got the space. And so it just kind of filled up with stuff and then people hanging out there. And, you know, that was always, you know, the initial, the initial magic was just it became a space where people were brought together where they had access to hardware they could play around with we had all we started collecting tons of manuals that we're you know we either bought at the flea market the mit flea market people like do you have the manual for this weird thing it's like yeah actually we do you just come there there, there's a stack of them like this why don't you come over and read them you know um and that's really how it all formed yeah, so, I, I, think that, I think a lot of the, a lot of like, you know, the history of the loft that we see is sort of what, what we call the new loft, right? So that would be like, I think 95 and later, but those early days were really important for, like Count Zero said, bringing that hacker community together, where at the time, you know, we were <clears throat> communicating on bulletin board systems, even though most of us were in the Boston area, we had never met in person, like we were just sharing information online. And when... John and Brian Oblivion started The Loft, that was like this kind of communal place to go. And that was a huge thing because then we got to meet in person and that's really where it started being this clubhouse like that more European style community. And that was like a really important thing that hadn't really been done a lot before then. There had been hacker groups, um, but not really these hacker kind of com- communes really is what it was. So that that was something where we were all kind of individuals, but supported each other in different projects and bring, you know, bringing everybody together. And then like Count Zero said with the flea markets too, we would have people come that weren't even in the necessarily the hacker circle, but people from the flea market that we might've met. And it's like, oh, come over to the, come over to the loft afterwards and like open up all your stuff and test it out and see if mm, it worked. That's and, right, that's you know, right. hang out and like, did you get fleed? <laughs> you know, did you buy something yeah. that didn't work? And it was just this fun, very, I would say for me, a very innocent time because it was this place to hang out with like all these other like really smart, older, uh, more, you know, just kind of well put together, it seemed, uh, people. You, you mentioned like bringing the stuff from the flea. That was part of the fun part of the hacker space was like, what did you trash at, at uh, you know, at, in a dumpster the other day? And, and you'd bring it and you'd show people. And one of the more fun things I remember is, uh, I, I used to work at Lotus in um, in East Cambridge, and there's a lot of biotech companies there. And um, I one of them was going out of business, and I found a centrifuge and an EKG machine, and I brought them over, and um, you know just just to start to you know share and play with this technology. Like, who has an EKG machine, right? It's kind of random, but we all kind of got access to it. The other part of it was fun was like. It was a place where people could stop and and visit like the hacker community in Boston. Like at the, the time I actually had the EKG machine, I think it was, was it Rob Gongrip was visiting us at the time? Yeah, from Hacktic. Um, and what was, he was from Hacktic, right? Yeah. Is that, yeah. yeah. And um, Rob was there and it was just like, it was a place, it was really just a place to hang out and just the crossover between hanging out and starting to do projects like, well, what can we do with the EKG machine, right? That was always in the in our mind, like, how can we hack it? Um, and so. that, that was a time too, where, you know, technology wasn't as accessible, right? So like, like you said, finding an EKG machine, or even finding a, a, a computer in the hallways of MIT or something that was like, oh my God, like, let's bring that back and use it. It's not like you could just go to Amazon and get whatever, which well, you couldn't you couldn't Google the manual either. Like, oh, you got an EKG yeah. machine. How do you use it? Oh, let's just Google the mo- the model number and get the manual. Couldn't yeah. do that. It all came from this love of wanting to explore technology that we wouldn't normally have access to, and I think that brought a lot of a lot of us together. Also, and and I remember too, and a lot of the sort of supportive infrastructure of the loft grew very organically. So I remember the the, the one thing I remember very clearly was, um, you know, we set up all these machines. You know, there was we didn't have any Ethernet connected or anything like that because back then you couldn't just go to Amazon and download a hub or whatever. It was still ten base two, right? <laughs> yeah, Coax. The, the, and so anyway, the thing the thing that precipitated it was Doom came out 
in multiplayer mode. And we were like, wow, we've got Doom running on our computers. Like, there's this thing called multiplayer, but you need an Ethernet network. All right, well, I guess we've got to set one up, you know? And so then suddenly we had a network and we're playing Doom on it. And then, and then we had a network. And so people would come over and be like, can I plug this into an Ethernet network? Yeah, we have one. Oh, really? Are you a business? No, we just wanted to play Doom. And so I still have a piece of cheaper net. It actually says cheaper net on the cable. This was a bad piece of coax that we had in our network that would crash doom. It took us months to find this. And I kept this piece of cable to remind me that there are bad cables in the world. Bad cables. I love it. Oh, I love it. That is beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, that was fun setting up the network because then we could do all kinds of things. Eventually, we got a, 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 um, you know, we got a modem and we got a router and we connected to the internet. Um, we went once at, I think it was right, 93. It was the internet access company. Mm. Um, got a nice yeah, I drove, the modem, I drove the modem to Bedford to drop it off. So yeah, so we, we dropped off a pair of modem. Uh, you know, we had the modem and the other modem. I think that was like one of our only purchases was that modem. Um, That's but everything why we started else on the to go whole to the network. Fleet to sell stuff was so that we could make money true. to buy the modems. Right. We, we sold the junk we found in the trash to buy the modems. Um, but one of the fun things was we uh, we actually back in 93, like getting a class C and having your own class C on the network was something that was easy to do. You just filled out a form and you had a class C and you were you were you were routed in the network. So back in 93, we had all these n- machines that we networked for Doom were all on the Internet. And I remember people would come back after the 2600 meeting just to like use a Mac on the internet. Like that was totally novel. Like libraries didn't even have it. You know, even if you weren't, if you weren't at a big corporation, you, you didn't have access to the internet. And, and we actually gave hackers that. We I remember the loft. I too, we had like an early, early webcam set up there. Uh, and I remember using CUC me, which was almost <laughs> like zoom, but super slow on dial up. And you could talk to other people and it was like, holy shit, like, wow, this is high tech. No one's doing this, you know? So it was really yeah. very yeah. cyber, <laughs> cyber, total cyber. And it was a dodgy neighborhood back then too. You know, we had people smoking crack outside yeah. the loading back the crack fiend. And back we even fiend. made to the point where like one of us took a picture of this guy smoking crack and then. One of the things I always loved was going to these different conferences, like, you know, like, uh, uh, Ho-Ho Khan and and you know I knew the Frack Magazine folks you know Craig Night Lightning and all those guys and then they'd, we'd have these different cons and stuff and I, always, I my thing was I always made stickers and so one year I made a sticker of of like Jack the Crack Fiend smoking crack and a sticker and it, it said something like you know the, the the loft more fun than a pipe full of crack I think that was Ho-Ho Khan 92 and I remember yeah I mean getting to the loft back then being a kid without any mode of transportation, you know, I would take the train from my house and then I would walk from, you know, from Copley through, you could take the orange line also, but that was like way more dodgy. So I'd take the green walk down through the South end. And every time I would get to the loft, I'd be like, thank God I didn't get jumped. (laughs) You know, like past these groups of kids hanging out. And like, I think it was more scary. I mean, I don't know, but I think it was more scary as a teenager because kids are always kind of going after other kids. So getting there and I had a skateboard, you know, so getting through that area was, was definitely sketchy. And I, I remember many, many times space rogue driving me home, uh, to avoid having to do that or like the trains closed. Right. Cause they and my closed. old four door Ford Escort that could barely work. Yeah. Yeah. You would drive like a maniac. I remember you were the most insane driver I ever met. What? No, it was very <laughs> safe. But that was part of the, that was part of the allure. Like that space was it, just an amazing place in, in the South end, like, like zero had said, like it was very un, undeveloped and kind of raw. And this space yeah. was yeah. this old loft art space and like just a very, very cool place. Well, also in, in, in true hacker style, we had free electricity, right? It wasn't that like part of the space. Cause we were, yeah. it was no. a, um, no air conditioning woodworking so. shop was below us and they had like really good power. That was part of the allure is like, we had free electricity to run all these ridiculous machines. Like imagine how much electricity a Vax uses. Oh, gosh. Yeah, but it wasn't an air conditioner. I think the lease said no air conditioners, but didn't say anything about mainframe. That's right. That's right. That was like, and we're like, oh, we're not going to run an air conditioner. What's we're that? We're just going to run that a mainframe. giant refrigerator. Oh, that's just, you know, electronics. This is a thing. It's a project. It's not an air conditioner. There's no compressor. 
I also like the the way that you guys had talked about like the organic growth of it, right? It's like the network. We didn't just build a network because it was because there was a game to play, and we, you know, it's just this organic growth of like stuff we'd collect at the flea market, and as we work on projects, it would get bigger and bigger. So I think it's important to note also that there wasn't some end goal of having the loft, right? It was just this space for us. So there wasn't this business goal. It was all just like, can we survive? Can we, you know, pay the rent? Can we do stuff we want to do in a cool environment? Um, and of course that morphed over time, but it, it didn't start that way. And it really was an amazing, I can't even, you know, I still get these emotional reactions to that time of that old loft. Like it was just an amazing place to be. That's yeah. And, and you know what I'm really, the thing I'm most proud of, of us as a group, um, one of the things I'm most proud of was um, Lady Ada. If you're a defender fighting to protect your organization from cyber attackers, you must be successful ending attacks every single time. They only need to be successful once. Cyber Reason reverses the attacker's advantage. Our future-ready attack platform gives defenders the wisdom to uncover, understand, and piece together multiple threats. And the precision focus to end cyber attacks instantly. Cyber Reason. End cyber attacks from endpoints to everywhere. Limo Fried, Lady Ada, is an influential engineer in the open source community. She studied electrical engineering at MIT and in 2005 founded Ada Fruit Industries, a company that designs and sells electronic kits for hobbyists. She was awarded numerous honorary awards, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award and Fast Company Magazine's Most Influential Woman in Technology. Yeah, she's definitely awesome. She was small enough that she fit inside the Vax. Remember that one time she crawled inside the Vax? And and she was just this this young girl, a tween, when, when when we met. And she was just brilliant. And she started coming and hanging out at the 2600 Magazine meeting and then coming over and hanging out at the loft. And it was just like everyone was so helpful to her. You know, and here's she was the only female, only woman, only girl at the time there. And everyone was just like so supportive of her. And when I've met her at conferences, like at the the, the last uh, 2600 uh, uh, Hope Conference in New York, um, you know, I, I hung out with her there and she was like, yeah, those, those, everyone was so nice to me. It was just got me going in the, like exploring tech. And now look at where she is with Adafruit. You know, it's just, it's just like, I'm like, oh, that's what it was all about. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Ve- Veggie introduced me to her, her at a 2600 meeting. He was kind of like guarding her, like, don't mess we with all were, We all were. <laughs> we were all and, and I just remember him saying like, she is going to be something someday. Right. And, and he just had just met her for a few months. He's like, he, she's going to be something someday. Yeah. I mean, I, look what happened. Lady Ada is like one example. There are a lot of people that were in our orbit or were in our influence who hung out with us who weren't necessarily part of the loft proper, but have gone on to be movers and shakers in the industry. And I think that the, the that circle of people is is unbelievably large for the small group that we actually were. I think what's also important, it's not just who went on to successful careers. I mean, you guys literally kept me out of jail. And it, that, you know, that, gr- that group of people at the loft and some of our surrounding people, you know, like everyone kind of looked out for each other. And I looked up to all of these guys as like my big brothers, because I had gotten arrested a year before mm. I joined the loft. And I was already involved with, with the hacker community and, you know, with all the guys in Boston. Um, but they sort of kept me a little bit at arm's length. And uh, after I got arrested, my parents were like, you got to do a sport or get a job to like keep you off the streets and causing trouble. Um, But at the same time, they still let me hang out with count zero and with space road because they knew those guys, they knew they were responsible people. (laughs) (laughs) Mostly. Did we we ever actually make some whipped cream over here? I got to make some whipped cream over here. (laughs) It was, it was a safe environment. Um, So it was interesting how, you know, they, my parents would pay the rent, for my share of the loft and let me hang out there even after I had gotten in trouble for hack, hacking related types of stuff, breaking into buildings and things. Um, 
but it literally saved my life and it kept me out of trouble for all of those formative years. And I learned so much about how to, how to handle myself, how to share information, the importance of being a hacker, the importance of working together in a group. So all of these things that came out of it. And I think a lot of that influence rubbed off on a lot of other people just in different ways. Right. So it really was something where, again, there was no plan, but how it shaped so many people is really what's amazing. And that's even talking, you know, pre before we went to the new loft. At their peak, the loft guys were every company's least wanted, most needed unofficial security. They'd poke around and find major bugs in products and services and websites, mostly for fun. But there was no standardized way to act on these discoveries. So a lot of the time, they just pissed off whatever company didn't realize they were so buggy. Like that time, Dildog, Christian Rio, who you've heard from a bit thus far, found the first ever buffer overflow exploit for Windows. It was an exploit in Internet Explorer 4 that essentially allowed him to run any code he wanted on any PC in the entire world. It was, of course, a big deal. The Loft guys published a proof of concept where if you clicked on their website, your whole computer would freeze right up. Nothing more than that, though. The point was just to show what they could do with such a powerful hack. Suffice it to say, Microsoft was pretty spooked. They emailed the Loft. If you guys could just hold off on making the biggest bug in the world public knowledge, we can fix the bug first, and then you can publish your findings. It may have been the first ever case of responsible disclosure. Yeah, I want to talk about some of the milestones that you guys sort of had, um, not just the day to day, but for example, um, I, I only know a couple from what I've spoken to Chris about already. Um, for example, when Microsoft wrote you guys, how do a few loose hackers end up getting the attention of, of Microsoft at all? I, that, that just came from basically the vulnerability research part of of what we started doing. Um, I think we started back at the old loft, but it just got more, more, more of it happened. I mean, I, I learned from, uh, you know, a, a fellow Bostonian hacker. I'm not going to mention, mention his name specifically who used to hang out there. Um, you know, I, I, I learned like the split VT vulnerability, um, where you could take over someone's, um, Con, you know, IRC console, right? If they were running split VT, which is, you know, you can split your C, your, your screen into a couple of screens. And he just showed me like that exploit. It was a zero day. This is like in 93 or something. And I'm like, I want to find those things. Like, that's really cool. Um, so I, you know, that that's kind of like at the loft was where I kind of parlayed my computer science and programming background into understanding, you know, how you can take bugs in software and exploit them. Um, and, you know, so that, that started, that, that started to be a thread in, in the loft where we started just doing this, doing this, doing this research and, uh, and publishing it. And, you know, when we started doing it, it was that complete, you know, we don't really care what companies will think. We just want to do it because, uh, we think information should be free and people should know about these problems. And isn't it cool? Like you can learn from this and then you can find these problems. It was just it was also partly a warning to other people who use that software. Hey, look, yeah, if you're using service. the software, there's a right. problem. Yeah, public service, you know, yeah. just you know, and, and, and so then, that 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 started yeah. to, you know, we didn't we didn't try to like have an agenda. We just started doing it. And then like the press, the tech press started to say, well, wait a minute, what are these guys doing? This is actually impacting businesses and people. And, and, and they started to, they started to come to us and say, you know, you guys are like making an impact on business. Like businesses are changing their behavior based on just stuff that you're publishing. And um, it just kind of built up and built up and built up until, you know, after a few years of that, you know, it started to upset Microsoft, basically. They're like, this is this is something we have to respond to. This is something we have to deal with. We like woke people up to the reality that was always there. 
Um, and we didn't really have any agenda behind it. Um, it was just information for, for people to use, whether you're a researcher or a user or the company itself, you should go and fix this. And so it got to a point where Microsoft said to us, um, you know, we think it would be safer for our users and probably easier for us to deal with the press if you guys would come to us and tell us about the vulnerability before you published it on bug track. And um, that was sort of the birth of, you know, coordinated disclosure. I think, I, I, I don't know of any earlier cases, except, you know, people used to send bugs to cert, but it really wasn't coordinated. It was just like yeah. you sent it to cert. Basically companies found out about bugs that people published via bug track uh, just at the same time as everybody else. You know, everything was just full disclosure because there wasn't any kind of, um, you know, protocol for interacting with companies and hackers. Uh, you know, the companies would just sort of be surprised by what they saw and had to scramble to fix things. Um, and in some cases, that was, you know, portrayed as irresponsible. Um, you know, the, there was a long, long conversations between the community and and the sort of corporate world about what responsibility really meant and on whose shoulders it fell. Uh, you know, if the people writing the bugs were seeing these vulnerabilities, but it would take months and months or never to actually fix the issues. Uh, you know, what did you do? Did you, you know, push out proof of concept code? Uh, did you tell the public? Did you go straight to the media? Uh, to what end did you need to, um, to shame companies into doing the right thing for their users and for the world? Uh, rather than their bottom line, which basically many, many times meant doing nothing. I mean, early on, you asked about Microsoft, early on, their responses to some of the advisories that I was pushing and things like Internet Explorer and IAS and stuff like that were mostly dragging their feet or telling me not to talk to the media and not to go and do anything. Uh, this is back when the, the email address secure at Microsoft.com was answered by one guy and they didn't have a security team. And there was no process and there was no rolling patches and there was no patch Tuesday or exploit Wednesday. Um, there was no, uh, you know, process for improving windows. Um, you got service packs and you got them once every six months or something, uh, maybe once a year uh, early on. And that was it. Um, so the fact that you have to deal with updates every single day, I'm glad to say that we have, you know, as it had something to do with that. Um, but uh, it just means that Microsoft and other companies that have followed suit have acknowledged that, you know, um, you know, releasing patches in a timely fashion and streaming them straight to the desktop was basically the only way to keep up with the, the fact that they've been pushing bugs for, for decades. You know, I, you know uh, Dill, I think it was the IE4 bug, which was the one that finally woke them up. Yeah. And they said, we better get these guys to send us bugs first because this is just so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because yeah. we would publish proof of concepts that would just work. You did the, what you clicked and it locked up your machine, right? You used the foof bug and the penny. Yeah. Some of, some of the, the proof of concepts were somewhat neutered. I mean, they, you know, the early ones could do things like download an arbitrary file and run it. Um, some of them would pop a calculator up on the screen just to show that it could run a thing. Um, others would run like the foof bug or whatever was sort of trendy at the time for locking things up. Um, just as a proof that, you know, this is obviously doing something you shouldn't be able to do and that the, you know, machine was being controlled. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the, the early exploits were, uh, in, in, I don't know, the, the line between weaponized and not weaponized was pretty blurry back then. These days, in order to weaponize something, it's got to be like three or four exploits in a chain. It's like a big deal. It takes you six months to get it right. Back then, like the exchange like, bug. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, these, you know the, the furthest I think I ever did, like a chain was like three or four sort of exploits in a row, but it was all inside like the same, same thing. Uh, I did a quadruple inverted backflip exploit back, you know, 2003 or something like that. Um, anyway, the, uh, you know, it was harder to write, um, you know, it's harder to write those kinds of changes today. So back then though, you, you know, your, your exploit, your proof of concept was pretty going to be pretty close to the, you know, how you'd, you'd actually use it in a, in a compromise scenario. So, you know, uh, it was kind of hard to jockey with companies to, give them something they could use to prove the vulnerability wasn't just, you know, uh, hand waving and it was worth their time to fix it, but also not give the whole world access to something that could be immediately destructive. So uh, the balancing was a little bit harder back then. These days it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, if something is a zero day and it can be used to build an exploitable, you know, chain of vulnerabilities, 
uh, and it's like on an edge, like something like SSH or uh, exchange, one of these things, you know, uh, it can be almost immediately destructive. Um, and you sell it and make a lot of money. You can make a lot more money. You know, back then we just gave that stuff away for free. It's like Bitcoin, you know, it's like you can buy them for a dollar. You know, exploits were like a Bitcoin back then. And now it's like $50,000, you know. I traded them for beers. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, you, true. You, you seen the, you've seen the NFT thing, right? You know, the, this new thing where you can use crypt, uh, cryptocurrency to trade art and like fungible, non-fungible tokens. But I, I, we need to be putting exploits on there. Didn't Microsoft respond once to some of your early vulnerabilities or something? They're like, I don't remember if this was at the new lock or the old lock, but it was like, um, you know, no one's ever going to do that, right? Like that, that yeah. the vulnerability is completely theoretical, theoretical right? And that's yeah, how the exactly. tagline making the theoretical practical turned exactly. into something. What, what, what was that? Do you remember? <laughs> that was, uh, that was loft crack. Yeah. Was it loft crack? I mean, it was good. Yeah. It was the, uh, you know, the cracking of, uh, NTLM and LM hashes. The biggest quote-unquote product to come out of the loft was Loftcrack. The tool could be used to test password strength and even potentially recover old and lost passwords via some common hacker tricks like brute force attacking and rainbow tables. It worked well. From 2004 to 2006, the security company Symantec sold it under their name. In 2009, some of the Loft guys bought back the rights and updated it for modern requirements. The latest version is still floating around today. Yeah, they said um, because they were they didn't know they had these implementation flaws in their password. Yeah. Right. So they took the strong hash, which they thought they were protected by. And they said, hey, you know, it can be 14 characters long and 256 different things. It would take millions and millions of years to, to crack. They only believed you when you showed them right. proof of concept. Code, well, they, right. That's the important had, thing is a lot of yeah. vendors back then, even even hardware vendors today that we still deal with. It's the same sort of thing of like they legitimately think they're secure. And they're like, no, 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 we don't. You know, that's impossible. No one's ever going to do that, right? But then once you prove it to them, they're like, oh boy, we better go do something. You call their baby ugly and they're like, <laughs> you know, they get upset, but then you show them their baby's ugly and they're like, oh my God, we better fix that. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. In part two, which will air next week, we'll hear how Loft evolved from a hacker's collective into a commercial entity and the problems that this major shift brought with it. Plus, is there a chance that the Loft guys will reunite once again to do great things? Hmm, the answer might surprise you. Stay tuned for part two and Chris Weissopel's B-side interview. Also, we are going to upload the full interview you just heard to YouTube. So if you wish to see the faces behind the hacker handles, search for Malicious Life on YouTube. Cyber Reason's Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Nate Nelson is the senior producer who miraculously managed to get all these amazing people into one Zoom call. And Ben Ohabari is our sound engineer. Our website is malicious.life and you can follow us on Twitter at, at maliciouslife or me at, at ranlevy. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. My email is ran at ranlevy.com and I'm always open for new and exciting ideas and stories. Thanks to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh my god. Oh my god. CK music, 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 music.